yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me here. And yeah, today I want to tell us, uh, tell on some ideas on using Higgs modes in superconductors to develop a new type of spectroscopy. So Higgs mode being the order parameter oscillation of the superconducting condensate uh, of interest. And we want to go beyond just the observation of these modes and really using them as a spectroscopic tool. So this is a project that started back in my time at the University of Stuttgart and the Max Planck Institute for Solid State Research within the Max Planck DBC in the Tokyo Center for Quantum Materials. And yeah, the main player here is Min Jae Kim, where lots of these uh, data shown today as part of her thesis. And she brought a lot of these high field terahertz experiments and also in the first steps to, to tabletop applications so that this really can become an applicable tool in the future. So we also enjoyed uh, collaborations with Bill Shimano's group at the University of Tokyo. And then the first part of experiments are uh, using the high field terahertz source at the Helmholtz Center, uh, Dresden Rossendorf. And we have theory support from Dirk Munster's group at the Max Planck in Stuttgart and Lara Van Spatel's group at uh, La Sapienza in Rome. Uh, samples and characterization of samples, both uh, transport and uh, linear optical properties come from Bernhard Keimer's department at the Max Planck in Stuttgart. So I told you we are interested in these collective order parameter oscillations of the superconducting condensate. So why are collective modes so interesting? We all know the collective modes of the lattice, the phonons of spin waves, the magnons of the electrons, the plasmons. In the correlated materials, we know we have the power of really looking at amplitude and phase modes, for example, of a charge density. And the big question is now, how about really looking at these collective modes of a superconductor? If I take now a very hand-waving picture, if I really want to understand something of a lattice, and then I want to understand the dynamics, if I just look at this, I see the atoms shaking around. But if I can perform Raman spectroscopy, can, I can learn a lot. I can learn about the symmetry of the crystal. I can learn about, if I look at the line shape, is this Lorentzian or Fano, I can learn about electron phonon couplings and so on. And the very key idea is now, if I can use such type of spectroscopy now on the superconducting condensates, what can I really learn? And yeah, what are these Higgs modes? So if I really look now, for example, at this complex order parameter of the superconductor and I plot the uh, free energy in this famous Mexican hat potential, then if I'm sitting here in the minimum, I have two types of collective excitations. Around the rim here, I have the uh, phase modes in the system, which for superconductors due to the Anderson Higgs mechanism are not the lowest excitations in the system because they are lifted up basically to the plasma frequency so that the lowest frequency excitation that remain stable in these superconductors are these amplitude oscillations here, the Higgs oscillation. The question is now, how do I excite these things? So cold gases people would now say, okay, let's shake the condensate. This is a little bit complicated in condensed matter. So the first way how really Higgs oscillations were seen was performing an excitation quench in this system. So if you take now your superconductor and now you come with an ultra short optical light pulse, you break a few Cooper pairs that quenches this Mexican hat potential and it does it on an ultra fast time scale. So my system does not even realize that something has changed and sees now a new potential minimum. And what's happening now, the system starts now oscillating around this new potential. And experimentally, this was for the first time shown by Ryoshi Manus group at the University of Tokyo. They took niobium nitride, they excited the system with an ultra short terahertz pulse. And then you see here, this is the excitation dynamics. And then the dynamics really was followed by these coherent oscillations. And what I could show is now, uh, changing the intensity of this terahertz pulse, they could con con control this quench. And then they could show that these oscillations here are basically following exactly the frequency of the superconducting gap. And that is a characteristic feature of these Higgs oscillations that the intrinsic Higgs oscillations uh, are oscillating at the gap frequency of the system. And the second way to excite these uh, Higgs modes, this is now using terahertz light where you are far below the gap. So you take now a monocycle 
terahertz, so this is a long multi-cycle pulse, and this is below the gap. In the linear regime, nothing should happen because we are in the optical gap of the system. However, one can show if you take now high intensity terahertz pulses, then you go to the nonlinear regime. Basically, you're going to couple to the quadrupole moment of the Cooper pairs in the system. And then one can show that the superconductor starts to respond with a two omega oscillation. So the response is really proportional to E square A square. Very hand waving. If you think about the momentum transfer of an electron to an electron, this is E times A. And then for the Cooper pairs, this becomes E square A square. And theoretically, one can also map this in the Anderson pseudospin model onto a Bloch sphere and then just calculate Bloch oscillations. And one can predict then that the superconductor really should respond with a two omega oscillation. If now these two omega oscillations become resonant with the intrinsic Higgs oscillations, the two delta oscillations, then we can also show by driving nonlinear Josephson currents in this material that there is a characteristic third harmonic generation. And also on the very same niobium nitride, the Shimano group could show this. So here you see in black, they were driving the system with a terahertz pulse. And then when they cooled down the system below the uh, transition temperature here, a characteristic third harmonic generation appeared. So these are now the two ways how to excite Higgs modes. What I now was interested in in this Higgs mode is to use them as a spectroscopic tool. And I'm quite interested in, for example, these problems of high TC superconductors, where in principle now we want to have an insight into these complicated phase, phase diagrams where we have a lot of competing phases where we don't really know is this an interplay, is there a competition, how are the couplings and so on, because so far usually people use excitation spectroscopies and really look at this. And now the idea is, okay, what about when we really can look at the order parameter dynamics directly? And the second motivation goes back to my time in Hamburg when I was working with Andrea, who is talking next, where we were really playing with light-driven superconductivity. And then, yeah, the most exciting experiments were, were, for example, in these YBCO systems by driving a specific molecular, uh, sorry, a specific phonon load, for example, modulating the apex oxygen in these cuprate structures, we could really come to a structure where the system showed something like a very yeah, superconducting like response in the system um, by looking at the inter bilayer Josephson tunneling. And most strikingly, we could really induce this yeah, superconducting like state throughout the whole pseudo gap phase in these materials. And future developments of this, I think Andrea will touch base on this in the, in the next talk. But back in this time, one of the big questions we were facing is always, is this real superconductivity? Because what we could not probe there, of course, this really looks like a superconductor, but we could not probe something like a transient Meissner effect, which is a difficult task. So what one is also searching is to have a new criterion for superconductivity that we can use on ultra fast timescales. Because these were states that were living just a few picoseconds, where it's really difficult to make a transport measurement. So and here, the Higgs mode comes into the play because the existence of the Higgs mode is also equivalent to the existence of a Meissner effect. So if I can probe a Higgs mode, then I know I have superconductivity in the system. So my motivation is to use this Higgs mode now to probe complicated interplays in superconductors, but also to apply this to non-equilibrium superconductivity in the future. So if I look at the magnet, right? Yeah. Um, then I can change in one way or another, the direction of the magnet energy, mm -hmm. and I can change the length of the magnet. Mm -hmm. And the Higgs mode is to some extent the length. the length of the magnet energy. So if I have a local moment section, why do I need to have long range magnetic order, may all faces align, yeah. in order to um, excite the length of the line? I mean, nickel, I can go above the two of them. And I see that there is an amplitude effect. Uh, so I don't quite understand your statement that uh, seeing the Higgs mode and amplitude fluctuation tells you anything about the orientation, the coherence. Of the yeah. There's one thing what we will see. We will also see responses that uh, 
appear, for example, when you have only short range coherence in the system, there will be a signal. So it looks like you're also sensitive to something like finite pairing amplitudes you have into a system. Well, and then that's just another way of saying is you yeah. can't tell. Yeah, yeah. The point Sorry, is, yeah, the, the second part, what we want to do, or I will show yeah. you also on the way when we want to investigate these transient properties of the yeah. system is that since we have, we will show you, I will have a phase resolved technique yeah. in the system that I can use techniques from the 2D spectroscopy. Right. So where I can superimpose basically uh, two pulses in the system that I can really tell if a response, for example, is due to a finite pairing amplitude or really to a long range coherence. Hmm? On, some. on some yeah, yeah, on some time scale, of course, of course. Can I interject a proposition? Yes, sure. I think that I, I by the way, you can tell me that I'm not a big fan of this. So I think that one of the things that we can state in this case is that the frequency of oscillation on one such node depends, let's say, linearly depends that we will be able to recognize some scalings uh, that are not the simple, you know, uncorrelated, um, uncorrelated. Uh, this is not correlated. It's a simple fluid. Yeah, yeah. So just seeing a THG alone doesn't tell you anything on that's this. If that's, if that's your point for us. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah. That is not the claim. That I is not the claim. That's annoying you so much. Yeah. How sure are you that you're seeing the Higgs mode? Your argument was yeah. the phase modes are transferred to the plasma frequency. Yeah. But if you actually are calculating the phase spec, the phase mode, if you actually are calculating the phase excitation of a BCS superconductor yeah. with polar interaction, yeah. you find there's also spectral weight just moved to above two delta. It yeah. yeah. looks indistinguishable from the amplitude from the Higgs mode. Yeah. So how yeah. sure are you that this is what you observe? Yeah. One thing is you, you perform also a polarization dependence. That is something I won't show now in the data, but okay. in all the data, you, you, of the light. yeah, of the light and in the system. And the then spin. you see if the if a Higgs mode has a full isotropic system, while every charge channel in this case will have yeah. a distinct flower on the polarization dependence, depending on the symmetry of your lens Wonderful. in the system. So that is a, that a check sense. that you always do. Good. I can tell you already now I'm yeah. skipping all of these double checks no, no. on this system, but that is something, yeah. But the point is that just saying C and THG is yeah. Higgs is, is uh, clearly not the case. There are many, many okay. things yeah. and these double checks have to be done. Yeah. Of course. So this general case that the total B was two delta has a different symmetry than the two delta oscillations of Higgs. Or, or when is it going to be the case? Because that's what you said, right? Yeah. Which are the which are quite exactly. That is at least for the for the A1G mode. If you have now a more complicated symmetry of the superconductor, in principle, you will have a full spectrum of Higgs modes. And then it depends on the momentum of your quench. And then it really matters the finite momentum of the light, even though it's very small. If you come, for example, crazing incidence. You can really make this happen. For example, if you do a Raman type of experiment and you come with a large numerical aperture, then you can really reach now phases where you see then also fingerprints in different symmetry channels, depending on the symmetry of the superconductor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's not that just okay, you do this experiment and then you have the one single fingerprint. You you need to double check the the, the signal. Maybe maybe let's go on and see the results first. And yeah, no, sure. <laughs> Okay, so let's jump into one of these experiments. So what I'm showing here is now we take LSCO, optimally doped, and then we perform a simple transmission experiment on this. And what you see here is the, the, the response above TC. This is driving terahertz light with 0, 0.7 terahertz that goes through the sample. If now we cool down the sample below TC, then you see here already uh, fast oscillations that appear. These are the third harmonic generation uh, that is kicking in in this sample. And now you can filter this, you can separate the fundamental driving versus the generated third harmonic generation. And then you can perform this now as a function of temperature. And if you plot this now and you do this now 
in a series of superconductors. So we have chosen different families of superconductors. Then you can find here the amplitude response of a system that here really kicks in below TC very, very prominently. What is shown here in the open circuits is really the raw measured data because the intrinsic signal is heavily dependent also of the screening in the system because of, as soon as the, the system becomes superconducting, you also screen out a lot of light. And there is a fine structure on top, which you can really see here in the raw data. You really have notches or shoulders here in the system that will be coming. So, so far, this is just the observation of a driven Higgs load now throughout different families of superconductors. But the interesting part is, since we are measuring here uh, really with phase-stable terahertz pulses in the system, we can not only look at the amplitude of these uh, responses, but also on the phase response of the system. Because we can measure the relative phase of the third harmonic signal compared to the driving terahertz. And if we do so, we can extend this amplitude spectroscopy into an amplitude and phase result spectroscopy. And what you see here is then also that, for example, you have prominent phase jumps that really match, for example, here, the notches in the amplitude response. And then making a longer story short here, what we really see here is that we don't only drive the simple Higgs mode in the system, but here we have a situation of two coupled modes in the system. And you see this because, for example, the phase jump is not like a typical phase jump from low to high, but from high to low phase. So this is really, describing an anti-resonance or a Fano type of coupling in a system. And you can model this here, and then you can really see also for coupled modes of a heavily damped Higgs mode and some unknown mode at that time, um, you have a response that really, uh, you can model then the temperature dependence of such a response where you really can see such an anti-resonance phase jump. And of course, what we do in these experiments, we always try with the same frequency. And then usually if you do a Fano resonance, you're more used to sweep the frequency. What we do in this experiment, of course, is we are sweeping basically the resonance frequency because we're changing the temperature of the superconductor. Yeah. No, it's, it's, a, it's a generalized Fano. So it's, 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 a, it's a coupled oscillator model, which for broad modes, you, uh, a generalized Fano is, is okay. And if you really map this now, where you go from the temperature to the frequency domain, you really can see here, this, is, this would be then the typical Fano line shape of such a resonance. The second observation that we have in these first experiments is that if you look closely, okay, our response is following the superconducting response in this proper density. However, there is also a finite response even above TC in these systems. And so there is a finite TH response on this. And uh, the interesting part is if you follow this finite response, you can find this response basically up to the Nernst temperatures in these uh, superconducting systems. So that is also something where we think now, okay, there is also somehow a response of possible finite pairing amplitudes above the sea in this system. But of course, it makes the situation now more complicated. Of course, now, what is the TH coming from and what are we really probing? If you just look at this norm normal third harmonic generation in the system. Stefan. Yeah. In an S wave superconductor, my amplitude mode is a branch up. Mm -hmm. But it's at least divergent with the one of a square root if I go to the to the uh, edge of two delta. Yeah. In a D wave superconductor, I have all those nasty nodal pairings. Exactly. Is, is there anything even left of the amplitude mode? Yeah, so what you have there, I'm coming at the end of the talk to this, in principle, you have now, if you look in momentum space, for each k direction, you are seeing uh, an oscillation with a different frequency. So now you have a, right. basically a multitude, and then what you're probing is something like an average density of states of this. But then what you can do is, in principle, you can now, uh, yeah, take this complicated uh, response and then uh, disentangle this into the normal mm. means, into the different symmetries of the Higgs modes. I'm coming at the very end. In the outlook, I'm showing one of these ideas where, where this becomes relevant. Um, yeah, so, so now we have two problems. One is, what is the nature of this new mode that, that is coupling here? And the other one is, okay, how can we disentangle now really these different contributions to the TH signal that we are measuring? 
let's first have a look at this other mode that could come. And here we think that we are really seeing somehow the coupling, phonon mediated coupling to charge density fluctuations in this system, because also there is previous work from David Hinton that has seen coherent oscillations due to uh, charge density wave responses in these coup rates. And they propose now a picture of a coupled order parameter between the charge density wave and the superconducting order parameter in the system. To check this, we have also, without going to, into any of these details, we have done now, for example, for LSCO, a doping dependence uh, study of this THG signal. And we have also performed a magnetic field dependent study of these. And then, yeah, we can discuss details there later. We can, if we compare, for example, the known responses of a charge density uh, wave response in the superconductors, we can come up with a model where we think really, okay, this is a, a possible scenario what we are probing. And a very nice one where we say, okay, this is now all based on models. Do we have a more direct fingerprint of the system? If you look into the time domain of the signal, you find a very interesting effect. So this is now the filtered third harmonic signal that we do. And then when you start doing this with very, very strong terahertz pulses, then you start seeing here sometimes a notch in the signal, which is changing its timing as a function of fluence in the system. And then first we thought, oh, somehow maybe we are suppressing superconductivity and then just reappears. So this, by coincidence, we were measuring with this fluence here in the measurement. And this was really in the middle of the peak. And we said, okay, this is the strongest response. Maybe even there, the terahertz pulse is already suppressing superconductivity. But then that would not explain why we really have these notches here. So this is really performing something like a quench and then doing a, a wave flat analysis of the signal, one can really figure out this has two components. This thing. And you can really expose these two components if you just change the temperature. Because then you can see that this first component here of the signal, when you increase the temperature, is going down while the second component is remaining. And so this first component is really going down at TC while the second component is most likely the one of the charge density wave if you compare this with phase diagrams where the charge density wave is measured with other methods. In principle, a CDW start too cold. Yeah. We basically have the same response to the current system that we don't know the energy, and we also indicate that we could say that it's base load and the whole thing. Yeah. So in principle, it does the same thing. Yeah. So yeah. it's not so surprising that we are that you see it. Yeah. I can tell you, also not in the talk, we are at the moment performing measurements on nobium diselenide, yeah. where you have really the best understood interplay of a charge density wave and superconductivity. And there indeed, we see an onset of THG that is really following the uh, CDW order. And then on top, because this is an S-wave system, we have this sharp resonance like in the Shimano measurements that really shows the response of the Higgs. And we also see the notches due to the coupling of this. But this is really data that is two weeks old. But yeah, if you're interested, I, we can have a private conversation and then have a look at this. But you're exactly right. You also see the CDW responses. And that means also, of course, with polarization dependence and so on, you really have to disentangle which of the TH responses come from CDWs and which from superconductors. But here you can clearly also see already, okay, you have the two responses and, and both uh, are driven in this thing. And then also one of the, the points where you can really distinguish them is also if, you, if you're not only looking at this third harmonic generation, but if you look also on this driven two omega response. Because there, if you do this, for example, you can see this here, then you see oscillations with two omega, but also omega oscillations. Because if you have systems that directly couple linear, they give you also omega oscillations. And then when the superconductivity kicks in, then these all these nonlinear currents, the currents become screened while the Higgs oscillations become enhanced on this. And here you see then, for example, that the omega oscillations become suppressed while the two omega oscillations become enhanced on this. So this is also an additional fingerprint how you can really distinguish a Higgs response from a nonlinear driven current. Okay, but here we have also a first fingerprint that in principle, we can look at the dynamics of the Higgs. And that brings me now to the second part where we really try now to see this transient Higgs response using this Higgs as a probe. That means we are performing now these THG experiments as before, but now we trigger some dynamics with an external laser. Of course, at one point, of course, we dream in repeating our 
light-induced superconductivity experiments and look at this response, but for a first step to really understand, can we do this and so on, what we try is we take a superconductor and we come now with a 1.5 EV light pulse, we destroy superconductivity, and then we look at the recovery of the superconducting state. And we know already from numerous optical pump probe, optical pump terahertz probe ex experiments, what is really the response of a superconductor as a function of time. So we have a, a huge body of literature where we can compare our results to. And now let's perform this experiment. So we do our TH experiment here. Now we come with our optical pump. And of course, now we are changing this TH signal. But we already know this optical pump is breaking Cooper pairs. And we already know, depending if we do this with a low fluence or with a large fluence, we either first break long range coherence and then we heat the system and then we have a subsequent uh, follow up on heating the system and breaking the condensate. Or if we do this with a very strong fluence, we directly break the Cooper pairs in the system. So this dynamics, of course, will also change our, our system. And the question is how to disentangle now these changes of the nonlinearities with these changes of hot quasi particles of preformed pairs, so to say, if you just break the long range coherence in the system. And that is the way where we now use the time domain signal to disentangle this. So that is now where we take now help from 2D spectroscopy techniques. So here we are not fully 2D because we are using just the gating pulse of our terahertz and the optical pump. So for a full 2D, we would need the full uh, two terahertz pulses in the system. But if we just plot this in our way, in this way how 2D spectroscopy does this, we can see here the field response of our terahertz pulses as a function of pump probe. And if we now perform a Fourier transform of the system, then we see here, okay, we have basically no change in the fundamental. And here we see we have a modulation on the stirred harmonic generation. And at the same time, also there's some new spectral rate appearing here in the, in, the, in the gap region. And if one looks at this in detail, one finds these oscillations here are two omega and four omega oscillations. There the first idea was, oh, do we have some symmetry break here in the system? Because there were works also in the literature that claimed that, okay, by driving nonlinear currents in the system, symmetry is broken. And that's why uh, there is certain harmonic generation or there is work also from the Shimano group. They applied the DC current to the system and then could really show this uh, second harmonic generation. But analyzing our signal, we can show in our case, we don't have this. So we don't break symmetry here. So this is not second harmonic generation what we're seeing, but sideband generation. And as we can see in the following, if we now also do a Fourier transform along the pump probe time axis, then we come up with these uh, 2D spectroscopy type of uh, plots. What we see here is our fundamental driving light, the third harmonic generation. Then in these cigars, in principle, we have all the information of the pump probe spectroscopy. That's the interaction with this uh, bandwidth of our short optical uh, pump pulse. So that is something where all the pump probe information is in. And however, here, there is no second harmonic generation in the system. And our second harmonic signal here is coming really from these sidebands in this system. And here I will just leave you with a very hand-waving picture of these sidebands. Our optical pump is creating hot quasi particles in this system. And they're here now in the presence of our terahertz driving field. So we are really driving basically now a nonlinear current with omega. And now this nonlinear current now is also modulating our three omega Higgs response in the system. And that then leads to a three omega plus minus omega sideband generation in the system. And that is the explanation for this modulation that we have here. So now that we understand the signal, now we can really concentrate basically on the uh, third harmonic response and see what we can learn from this. So what we are doing now is we take our third harmonic generation signal and now we are only looking at the amplitude changes of the signal by putting ourselves here on the peak of the third harmonic response. And then if we change the pump probe time delay here, we see the changes. And then here we see this sideband oscillations on the onset of the signal. And this here is now where one could say, okay, this is the response time of the melting and recovery of the superconducting response. And 
if we look now at these changes of this amplitude, what do we learn from this? If we plot this now as a function of fluence, then we can see if we increase the fluence, then we really have here something that goes over square root of the intensity. So something we really drive with the field. So like an amplitude mode, if you drive an amplitude mode, this should go proportional with the field. And then if you hit the known threshold where really direct Cooper pair breaking sets in, then you also see we are depleting the condensate. So the amplitude is going down again in this material. So that is also something where we, that really shows, okay, we are really probing the intrinsic properties of the condensate and not the excitation spectrum. If you would perform the same with excitation spectrum, with a terahertz spectrum, then this response here would go up because you're exciting more quasi particles in the system. And now if you perform a temperature dependent uh, sweep of this, and you look now at these changes of this TH, then you see, okay, you get a sign change here around a temperature that is significantly uh, below the uh, superconducting temperature in this material. So, and, okay, very good. And um, if you compare this, then you see these uh, sign changes in the TH changes really map also to the onset of superconducting fluctuations that are also known from linear spectroscopy. You can really uh, map then also the range here from the onset of fluctuations below TC up to the point where superconducting fluctuations were seen even above TC. But the big question is now, okay, now we see also all these different contributions. Can we really get now to the heart of the Higgs response itself? And for this, we have to now really look at the transient spectral properties of this. But here we have a problem because when we do our pump probe experiment, then this beginning of the pulse probes a different delay than the end of this pulse. So what you have to do in principle is you have to move now your pump pulse and your gate pulse in parallel so that your terahertz driving field is always probing the same time delay after the excitation in the system. In a 2D spectrum, effectively, you're just flipping the whole system by 45 degrees. That's now the transient spectral response of the system. And if you analyze this, then you see you have a strong modulation in the fundamental response in the system, only a weak modulation in the third harmonic response. In agreement with our picture that we don't have second harmonic generation, you don't see a second harmonic system here in this material. And now, of course, you have to take into account also these uh, that our optical pump is exciting the quasi particles is changing the screening so you have to compensate also for the screening in the system and if you do this then you come up with a response that looks like this these strong oscillations here so far we have no idea where they come from they come clearly from these driven hot quasi particles in the driving field but what is interesting, if we ignore the strong oscillations here on top is, what you see is here we have the system before the excitation is as the superconducting, uh, as the laser pulse arrives, we have a abrupt depletion of the condensate to zero, and then a recovery of the uh, condensate within a few 10 uh, picoseconds in the system. And that is a time scale that is completely different, for example, from the relaxation time of hot quasi particles that is known from pump probe experiments. And that's a time scale, for example, that matches exactly time scales from time resolved ARPAS experiments where people really look at the dynamics of the gap. And that is something we can really directly match here um, with this technique. So that shows us really with this technique, really, we are probing really the intrinsic uh, response of the, of the gap in this material. So with this, I come to the conclusion of my talk. I showed you that we really try to establish a spectroscopy of collective order parameter oscillations in analogy a little bit to the phonon spectroscopy and establishing an amplitude and phase resolve technique that gives us now really a new insight into the dynamics of the condensate, external couplings to the condensates. And yeah, one of the key techniques is really driving the, these uh, Higgs oscillations in these, uh, these parts. And we have seen also, we have now probes to also 
have possible finite carrying amplitudes even above QC. And then besides all what we've discussed before, polarization dependencies and so on that you have to do to perform double checks, what THG signal is really coming from, from what source, uh, these methods from 2D spectroscopy tremendously help us to disentangle the different uh, sources of the uh, THG signal in the future. And maybe as a very small outlook and in the direction what, what uh, Jörg was asking, if we now have a complicated order parameter in the system, so in principle, if we go away from an S-wave order parameter to, okay, here for the superconductors, we had a D-wave order parameter, then of course the Higgs mode is not just a simple A1G mode that is a full symmetric one, but then depending on the quench symmetry of your laser pulses, now you can come up with multiple Higgs modes in a system. And if you take this for the D-wave order parameter, for example, this could look complicated as this, because now in each direction, in principle, you have now an oscillation with two delta of K, so to say, and now these signals, you can try then to disentangle, but for this now you need an amplitude and momentum resolved in the system. And here the idea is you can take now time resolved ARPUS, which in principle by itself is only an amplitude uh, sensitive technique in this. But if you now do this driving experiments with phase locked terahertz pulses, you can make, for example, these amplitude resolved technique into an amplitude and phase resolved technique in the system. And that then hopefully can allow to disentangle these kind of responses, for example, into the eigenmodes of the system, depending on the symmetry quench that you apply to the system. And that would then allow to see either the, the different modes directly in the momentum space, or if you would do this now with a frequency sweep, in the system, then of course, all these different modes can have also different frequencies in the system, which by theory, one can even calculate. And then in principle, for a given order parameter, you can predict then a spectrum and vice versa. And that's then some of the ideas that we try to push now in the future. And with this, I thank you for your attention.